Blah, 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 blah. And, and, and then, then, oh, there's applause. a sound effect. I did it again. <laughs> hey, maniacs. Hey, maniacs. It's Midsummer Maniacs. Midsummer Maniacs. And boy, are we maniacs. Yeah. This month has been crazy already, and we're only halfway through. I'm not going to make a sound effect about being crazy. <laughs> You're not getting that bingo square, <laughs> if I can help it. Midsummer Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. I'm Mark. I'm Sarah. And And right at the top, I have a correction for last week's episode. The most comments we've ever gotten about anything on an episode. (laughs) I don't know. There were a lot of comments about whether Winter wears underwear with those pajamas. Hokity smokity. But last week, for the Dagger Club, there was a subtitling error on YouTube where they made it look like one of the characters dropped the F-bomb. Yeah. But what she actually said is fob. Yes. You can't fob me off. Yes. Right? And that's correct. She clearly says that. She says fob. It makes sense in context. But I've, man. I know the phrase and everything else, but the subtitles. The captioner was right to the F-bomb. Gave man. her a wordy dirt. Yep. Which just makes me wonder, like, how much dirtier is Midsummer if you're hearing impaired? Like, <laughs> especially if you watch it on YouTube, because they seem to be kind of curse heavy on YouTube. I'd, maybe it's an algorithm thing or something. Maybe. Just to let you know. But for the record, we know it's Fob. Hey, we're all in accordance. This is a spoiler podcast, so we tell you who the murderer is right away. And warning, if you let your kids watch the show, they should be able to listen to the podcast. Yeah. It was Carol, by the way. Yes. (laughs) Gideon's creepy mom. Because this week we're talking. She should really be called Karen. Uh, No. No, she's special. She's a one-off. No, she's... We're talking about Season 17, Episode 2, Murder by Magic. Yes. Filmed in June and July of 2014. Broadcast the 4th of February, 2015. 5.59 million views. Directed by Charles Palmer and written by Rachel Cooperman and Sally Griffin. This episode centers around this guy who's an illusionist. And he's one of those black eyeliner, black t-shirt wearing illusionists. Like um, Chris Angel. Chris Angel. Yeah, kind of the the broody. Do you think he looks like Jack White? He looks a bit like Jack White. A I young, got that. A young Jack White, I which got... I didn't think the first time I saw it. If you're not familiar with who Jack White is, he's the singer from the band The White Stripes, and he's also done a lot of other things. Yes. They, they look a lot alike. They do. He and that actor. So we're in Midsummer Oaks. Yes. Which is near Midsummer Mirror, apparently. Near-ish. Near-ish. But we've never been to Midsummer Oaks before. No, and guess what? The church needs some money. (laughs) What do you know? It needs to be repaired. So so they're doing some fundraising. Did you see how much money they'd already raised? No. They'd raised 200,000 pounds of the needed half million pounds. Well, then why was the thermometer so low? It should be like halfway. It's at 40% where it should be. Oh, okay. It looked lower than that. Yeah. But I only glanced at it. Yes. Yeah, I love that. So there's a scene... When we find out that all this is for repairs, right? Yes. Where the vicar is talking to Barnaby and he says, if we don't raise this money really, really soon, we're going to lose this church. It needs serious repairs. And he turns and looks over his own shoulder as if he's looking at the evidence of what is so wrong with the church. Yes. But of course, we don't see what he's looking at. No. So what do you think is so wrong with the church? Well, it was hit by a meteor. And so there's a gaping hole. Oh, you think it's a big hole? Yeah, maybe. I was wondering if maybe they like held their roof roof off with duct tape or something. It's half a million pounds. Like it's got to be some serious structural <laughs> damage. And okay, we need this money, or we're gonna lose the church. What What does that mean? Like, I think it means it's gonna fall down. Okay. Like if we don't fix it. <laughs> This church is not going to be standing anymore. The council's going to condemn it. It's not like we got to get some more buckets to catch the leaks. It's, yes. It's not going to be sound anymore, which is why I think they've got a little old lady over in the corner, like holding up that side of the <laughs> roof. And she's like duct taped to the wall. Keep it up, Myrtle. 
You can do it. We'll raise the money as fast as we can. We'll raise it as fast as we can. I got it, Vicar. It's okay. <laughs> I want to know who was the first person to use one of those thermometers to do their charity fundraising thing. It had to have been like a healthcare. Thing. It's brilliant. It's smart. Yeah. It's better than the little yodeler going up the hill. Yeah. Like climbing a mountain or something. Yeah. That was in one of the hospitals in mm-hmm. midsummer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. so we're in St. Cyprian's church. This is the church that's about to fall down. So St. Cyprian, he's an interesting cat. Yeah? Yeah. I'm so not familiar with St. Cyprian. First of all, he's a Berber. So he comes from North Africa. Okay. So. Cool. Definitely not your sort of traditional white Anglo-Saxon. That's awesome. Guy. What I found interesting about him, he became the Bishop of Car- Carthage. Mm-hmm. And he's a well-known dude because of that. But. There's a thing called the Plague of Cyprian. That's not good. Okay. But it's named after him because he described it, not because it had anything to do with it. So he didn't have it. No. It wasn't a plague of Cyprian's. Like, he didn't doppelganger himself and and go everywhere or anything like that. He just said, hey, you know that plague that was back there? This is what it was like. And And they were like, cool, we'll name it after you. Yeah. No, thanks. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) <laughs> That's the worst luck in naming ever. Wow. No, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> no, you can name it. I'll give it a name. Don't name it after me. He, of course, was uh, martyred and all sorts of things. But it's very rare. There's for, not much that happens after you're martyred. Yeah, the, the, it's very <laughs> rare for Anglican churches to be named for him. I can imagine. Yeah. This magic show, everybody's saying this evening, tonight, but the sun is out. I, I don't know what time it's supposed to be. Long ago, we it's gave in, up. It's <laughs> in June, so I mean, I mean, I guess the sun stays up a little bit later. I guess we're trying to figure out times in this show. Is it could be seven thirty, eight o'clock? I could guess. be. It could be. Yeah. There's some nice piano work at the beginning. Yeah, but it doesn't go with a magic show no, at all. It does not. Like, and there was a band supposed to be. Like Gideon's like, I'm so goth. And she's playing like Bach or something. And Luke was supposed to play in a band. And then what happened to the other guys in the band? They were just like, oh, I guess Luke's not coming. We're not going to perform now. I guess. They canceled. Well, he and Hannah can't both be there. One of them has to be watching the pub. Yes. The green man. Bingo. He's got to watch after the pub because she's there playing the piano, which is completely antithetical to the rest of the show. And when they start the music... <laughs> it's it's weird. First of all, if I'm Hannah, I'm stepping away from that piano when my part's over. I'm not staying there on stage. Yeah. I'm stepping down and sitting down. Why she stays there, I don't know. And like, let her finish. Yeah. Just let her finish the song. So like, blah, 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 blah. Brum. And, and, and then, then, oh, there's applause. your sound effect. I did it again. <laughs> this bingo card has really got you screwed. I'm cursed. <laughs> it's fine. I hope everybody gets bingo. Anyway, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't match. The, I don't know if the band would have matched it better, but... I think what matches it less is if this per, if this church is in such bad repair, should you be letting off fireworks inside no. of the church? No. Like, indoor fireworks are... Risky in, at best. In essence, dangerous yeah. already. Yeah. <laughs> We're like the oldest old people here. We are. We're like, that's a fire code infraction. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're going to light the fire arrangements on fire at least. But maybe they're like, we got nothing to lose. There's not very many people there. Even if everybody there paid 20 bucks, it's not enough. And, and I'm <laughs> going to tell you right now, from start to finish, the magic in this episode is shot poorly. Well, Mark... If you listen to Nelson, it's just illusion. It's not real magic. Well, I know it's not Why real. doesn't he say, because magic's not real? He I says, don't. it's not real magic. Because there's no such thing as real magic. Okay, anyway. <laughs> they, they, like, the shots of it make it clearly show how it's done. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Because like, we kind of need to know sometimes to know, like, whether or not it could have impacted, you know, somebody being head shoved through a piano (laughs) we'll get to that (laughs) he's doing his magic he's floating his little ball and then the rig explodes basically yeah and i have in my note don't kill the piano player oh too late (laughs) because somebody has put like a nitroglycerin pack on one of the cables and it's remote controlled so 
Remember, Carol did it, right? Gideon's yes. mom did it. Yes. So she waited till he was out of his glass box. Ooh, but right. But not far. He not could clear. Have easily been killed. Oh by this. yeah, yeah. I could have easily swept him and Hannah into the piano. Yeah. So she's sitting in the audience. With her button, I guess. Remote control. Because she knows about nitroglycerin. How? Well, she's a better magician than okay, her. Okay, nitroglycerin is not involved in magic okay, shows. Okay, she's a better magician. Okay. No. No. No, she knows about bomb making now. I guess. And remote controls. Exactly. Radio controlled bombs. And managed to do it while there are at least two other people looking at the equipment. Mm-hmm. She is magic. Yeah. Maybe she's got real magic. And it slams poor Hannah through the piano. Oh, man. <laughs> when you see the box broken, it's clearly broken at like two spots. Like they yeah. went, okay, it would be impacted here. It has no no correlation to the shape of Hannah or Hannah's piano where no. it breaks. But man, they do a good job of shoving her head through that piano. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they must have taken a saw to the piano. Oh, a sledgehammer? Something. Even if it's, I mean, I'm sure it's a fake panel on the front of it that's out of something that's a bit more breakable and they Maybe. just kind of broke it up. But still, then they shoved her head into it. <laughs> wow. Put your head here, lady. <laughs> It yeah. makes me wonder how many people actually have died doing magical tricks. Oh, you want to know? Oh. Well, I don't have a count, but I oh, do have okay. one really good story of somebody oh, okay, died, okay. died doing a magical trick. Okay. You won't believe this. Oh, boy. This is something else. So this is in 1934 mm -hmm. that this magician died during his trick. Okay. So his name was Black Herman. Okay. He was a preeminent African-American magician. Okay. During, in 1934? That's right. That's, that's pretty cool. During Jim Crow and all that stuff. Yeah. He's a brave dude. But he mostly performed in the South. So one of his illusions that he used to promote his shows was that um, he would be buried alive for three days. Okay. And when they dug him up, that would be on the night of the show. Like, that's how he would start the show. So they would use it to kind of like... Um, you know, encourage people That's to That's how the to show come, started. Right? Yeah. 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 So you would hear about this guy being buried for three days. And this is a, like a common trick. They make fun of this in uh, Jonathan Creek. Yeah. And, because yeah. It, rarely are they actually buried. They're no. somewhere else. Yeah, they're somewhere else. Hiding for three days, yeah. right? And, and I'm sure that's what he did too. But when they reburied him to un unbury him, he had a heart attack and he died. Oh. <laughs> but nobody believed it. They were like, oh, he's faking it. He always fakes it. That's what he does. <laughs> That's a Midsummer episode right there. Yeah, they didn't believe that he was really dead. And so his family used the disbelief to their advantage and they sold tickets to his funeral because there were people who were sure he was going to come back. What a bad <laughs> show that was. Like, you're just waiting, waiting. And then... <laughs> come on, Black Herman, sit up. Sit the up, Herman. Come on. Goes on. The wife cries. They put him the in the ground. Cry. Everybody goes they put home. Him in the ground, and, and there must have been people going. Uh, uh. Well. And his wife was probably like, "I told you he was dead. Told you he's actually dead." It says funeral on the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> How anticlimactic would that? Have been? I wonder if somebody like stood up and went, "Okay, now it's time. Sit up now." I paid for this. Come on. Come on, Herman. Something needs to happen. Poor Herman. So there's a good story of somebody dying during a magic trick. Later, when we get to the bullet in the teeth, I've got some other examples of that not going well. I can imagine. The Barnabys are out for beer. <laughs> and wine. Yes. They're outside with a baby. Yes. That's a big deal with yeah, your first baby. It is. It is a big deal. Barnaby's going to take care of the baby. Mm -hmm. right? And he's going to watch... She didn't say you're gonna you're gonna babysit. No, I was not glad. Babysitting. I was glad to hear that. And Barnaby she didn't say you're gonna babysit. Say he was no. babysitting. He's but it is taking his, care of his It is baby. his first time taking care of her alone. Yes, and they're gonna watch Thirst for Blood and The Mummy Rises. <laughs> Do you know what they're from? Neither of which are they actually watching on the screen. Right? Yes, they are. Oh, are they from the? Definite. Hammer like movie movie festival episode. Those are those are the two movies from Death and the Divas. And later on in the episode, when he's watching it, he's watching The Mummy Rises that has the original Hammer actress in it. Oh, that's cool. That's a good throwback. I didn't even notice that. I just knew that it wasn't a real movie. Yep. 
that he was watching. So Gideon, the magician, Gideon Latimer, and his mom and his wife and his manager, sidekick, Theo, are in Midsummer Oaks because he's just bought a house in Midsummer Oaks. Yes. Right? Because he's he was he grew he's up so rich. He grew up nearby. So he bought a house yeah. there to kind of come home. And the first things he's doing are these fundraisers to kind of help raise money for the church. I don't know why, except that maybe his mom told him to do it. He doesn't really seem interested in the church. I would think that he would have a little more independence from his mother by now, but... He can't shake her. I know. She folds his underwear, for God's sake. Oh, my mother doesn't touch my underwear. No, 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 no. The house he buys is Melmoth Hall. Yes. It is amazing. It oh. is so beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, just it's, the chimneys. It's a gorgeous house. They call them barley sugar chimneys. Oh. Where it's that two-tone brick that's kind of twisted. Yeah, those are super you know, cool. They're really pretty. So Melmoth Hall is really Cheney's Manor. That's the name of the actual place. Okay. And it's haunted. Oh, it's haunted? Mm -hmm. Ooh, October scariness. You want to hear about the haunting? Yes, let's hear about the haunting. So there are one or maybe two ghosts. Okay. It depends who you listen to. <laughs> it depends which source you go with. People who stay there have heard heavy footsteps on the stairs from a thump, limping thump, man. Thump, thump. Okay. And the limping man is important because Henry VIII stayed there. Okay. Later in his life when he had all of his ulcerations on his legs and yeah. he limped. So it could be him. Or during the English Civil War, a lot of soldiers came to Cheney's Hall to recuperate. They had kind uh, of a okay. hospital. And so it could be a limping soldier. So actual royalty visited this. Oh, house. yes. Uh. Henry VIII and Elizabeth I both stayed there hmm. at, at one point in time. Yeah. And there are no south-facing windows on the house because the man who built it thought that the plague would drift in. From the south. From the south, yeah. Okay. Because that's, London is to the south, right? And so he, he put no south-facing no windows south, on the house. That's interesting. That whole side of the house is just brick. That's weird. They may have put some in in the sense. I hope but, so. But very few, and there were no original ones. Okay. Because he didn't want that pestilence blowing in his place. And that has Gideon and his mom. Mm-hmm. And then Theo and Gideon's wife. Yeah, Annabelle. Who are clearly the worst adulterers oh of all Oh, my gosh. Time. They're so bad. They may as well just make out in the room where Gideon is, like <laughs> right next to him. I mean, it, never mind that they, they kiss in the garage, like in full sight of the windows of the house, like... Okay, there's a side of this house that has no windows. Go over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the makeout side of the house. Go south. Yes. It's fine. Nobody will see you, right? Not only that, but everybody knows his mother is there and that she's super nosy, super protective, super everywhere all over the place. Why would they do anything at their Anywhere house? Anywhere near that, that house. house. Nothing. Nothing. They're bound to get caught. They're just, yeah, they're bad cheaters. We've got the vicar... Who is uh, Sohn. Yes. Right? Magnus Sohn. Magnus is such a great first name. That is a great first name. And his wife, Lorna, who's played by Deborah Finley, who's, she's a great actress. She does this part like she does every part that she plays like this. I don't know of any part she's ever played where she's not pinched faced and bitchy. And, she's really good at that. And slightly trashy skeezy. Yeah, but with an, an affect of poshness, right? Yeah, like willing to jump into bed with something without a moment's notice. <laughs> something. <laughs> and, you, and yet you're like, oh. But look down on you afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> she's she, fantastic. I'm sure she's a wonderful person. Oh, I love her. She's in really good she, at playing this kind of role. Everything she's in, I love her because she does this so well. So we've got the battle of the vicars here. And well, Andrew's a curate. He's no. a curate. Andrew Maplin, which means that he's in his first four years post school. Yes. So this is supposed to be like one of his first posts. Like he's right out of school. But then they later on, they say that he's been transferred a whole bunch of times because he's loony cuckoo, cocoa for cocoa puffs. Well, and, and that can happen, right? So theoretically, the idea is that they assign a curate to a vicar who is near retirement. So in the years leading up to the retirement, the curate can 
learn, kind of do like an internship, sort of be his assistant. Yes. And then when the vicar retires, the curate takes over. And Soane, he's a beneficed clergyman, which means he's got tenure. Oh, okay. Basically. Okay. So he's been promised a house for life. Okay. Care for life. So theoretically, as he gets older, Maplin would be the one who would help him. Theoretically. I mean, that's how it's yeah. supposed to work. Because you stay here, Maplin stays in a, a secondary accommodation near the church. And as Soane gets too old to take care of himself, Maplin should help out. I wouldn't trust that guy to do my laundry. He's, uh, he's, he's nasty. And like, okay, I understand that they have to create a dichotomy here between these two religious people. But I wonder how often this actually happens in England, like in villages, how much fire and brimstone actually happens these days. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many Anglican fire and brimstones there are. I, I have a feeling you'd get kicked out of theological school if that's that's the way you were leaning. They'd I, say, why don't you go to America? I think it's a lot more Rev Sue's and a lot less Andrew. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's much more successful. Rev Sue's is more successful. Well, she's especially out in, the, in the band. <laughs> <laughs> but she's out in the community. She's getting people involved. That's how a church stays relevant in the community. Yeah. Not the way what he's doing. No. Everybody yeah. dis dislikes him immensely. Immensely. Yeah. He's not doing anybody any good. I kind of wanted them to fight. Yeah, I'd like that. I think that um, Magnus and Lorna could kick Maplin's butt. Oh, I think so, They'd too. have to work together, but they could pick his butt. And then you have Alyssa Probert, who's a church warden. Yes. Which means that she's like a lay person who helps out. Yes. Does she even need to be in this episode? Oh. She and her husband, the florist? Her, the two of them. They're a waste of space. They just might as well be called the red herring florist. Bingo. It, they they just don't serve any purpose other than to say, well, Hannah wasn't perfect. Okay, well, no, she didn't need to be. She was just a pianist. Yeah. It's not like it, we, we were supposed to think she was a saint. You never, ever think. Like, Dr. Dorothea Grenville is a more important person in this episode yes. than they are. I want more Grenville and less Yeah, she needs her own Probert. show. She need, Dr. Laura Grenville needs her own. Dorothea Grenville needs her own show. Well, she's played by Marilena Kendall, who was in The Electric Vendetta. Yeah. So we've seen her before. The only thing good about the Proberts is his first name, Rodri. Rodri. With an H. Yes. Just for fun. We Rodri. 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 Gideon doesn't want to give up the secrets to his tricks, even though Barnaby and Nelson sort of need to know so they understand how this could have happened. Yes. And... And we learned that young Nelson had a magic trick. A magic <laughs> he got a magic kit, kit when he was when little. When he was young. <laughs> but Barnaby says they're not going to kick you out of the magic circle. Yes. You know what that is? You well, know about the magic circle? So what I know of the magic circle is, is a group of performing magicians, kind of like a union of people who share tricks. Mm -hmm. And they agree to keep them secret. Yeah. And I think it's like... The, what I know of it is, it. I think it's probably Hollywood-based, California-based. No, there's a, a different organization in the U.S. that is based in L.A. Mm -hmm. It's like the Magicians Club or something. I don't know. But the Magic Circle is a British thing. Okay. I thought it was interesting. Their very first meeting ever was held in a pub called The Green Man. Oh. Which is the name of the pub in yeah. Summer Oaks. The other thing I didn't know about them, I knew that you had to be like sponsored for membership. So you have to have two current members in good standing sponsor you for membership. And then you're like on kind of probation and you have to prove yourself to be actually admitted mm -hmm. at the most kind of basic member level. And you can do a performance exam. Okay, that makes sense. Or a thesis. Oh. You can write a thesis to get into the magic circle. Okay. I so understand. you don't have to be a performing magician to get in. So I would assume Jonathan Creek's magician and Jonathan Creek would be part of this group. Yeah. Yeah. And so Jonathan Creek wouldn't have to perform magic. He would write a thesis about like the design of future tricks or uh, maybe historical thesis that studied, you know, performers of the past. And you can get in either way. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So I wonder how many academics are in the magic That's circle super just because they study it. Sudden cult. <laughs> yeah. It comes out of nowhere. It's like the sun went down, put your robes on, and everybody just starts walking out of their houses wearing With their robes. Robes and leaves on their face. Like, whoa. <laughs> 
when so you really can't see their faces because they're hoods right so you don't know about their masks right away but when the priestess is in front of the fire in front of the pyre and you you still you can't really see any detail because it's all silhouette she turns to the side and i forgot that they were wearing green man masks yeah her she looks like teen wolf from the side (laughs) I took a picture. She looks like a wolf man who sort of had a trim. So she's... <laughs> like wolf pagan, kind of hairy priestess. What I want to know is who's the person looking out the window? Because it can't be Rodri. Cause no, because he's, in, the he's group, in it. Right? Hannah's dead. Hannah's dead. It can't be the vicar because he's drugged. Oh my gosh, she drugs him. She drugs her husband. <laughs> It's so wrong. So wrong. Who is looking out the window? I don't know who it is. It could be. It could be Elsa Probert. No, no. It's a man. Oh. Um, A man looks out the window. It's not Theo. The person has hair. It's not Luke because Luke's there. Oh, it's Andrew. It's got to be Andrew Maplin. He looks out the window because then he follows them with his video camera. It's got to be him. I guess. He's the only man left. But Everybody he's not else dressed is either like drugged a vicar. or there. He's not dressed as the vicar. Well, you wouldn't be if you're going to sneak after him. Oh, I guess. Though, if you're dressed as a vicar, all you got to do is take your dog collar off and put on a sock hat. And you're kind of ninja already. That's true. It's not a big leap. I did notice they had really nice torches. Nice torches and colorful robes. They did. They're they, all in different they were, colors. They were a fun cult. Yeah. yeah. I don't like Lorna's quilted coat. No. It looks kind of like a packing blanket with with jewels sewn on it. And she has like a crown thing, right? And yeah. I'm like, mm. She totally looks like Teen Wolf in profile, though. <laughs> okay. You got to see that picture. We'll have to send the Teen Wolf picture. Yeah. So they're out there burning some fake body and effigy to welcome in the summer. It's June. It's kind of late. Yeah. It's not spring equinox, it's that's weird. for sure. It's it's weird. The timing is weird in terms of winter, spring, and summer. Mm-hmm. And then we find out that Hannah had an affair with Rodri, and we're like, so? Who yes. cares? We also find out that the pub is a money pit. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. That's what Luke says. Yeah, they're not making any money. So Hannah inherited the pub from her dad. Yes. And has been running it ever since. And since they got married, Luke has been helping. But he clearly doesn't have a whole lot to do with the finances because when they say, I thought the pub wasn't making any money, he says, well, that's what Hannah told me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That we were losing money. I wanted to figure out where money pit came from. Yeah. Because now we use it as a term, like anything that you continually have to put money into, like all the time, like a a house that's falling apart or whatever. That's a relatively recent uh, use for it. It used to be, it was a pit. In which you dug in the ground and you put money into. <laughs> what to hide it? To hide it. Oh, like uh, like like when the the Vikings would bury like a hoard. Yeah, that well, was a money pit. But that's kind of a good thing. Yeah, I mean, unless somebody finds it, or then, you forget where it was. <laughs> then, it, then it became associated with Oak Island, uh, which is. A money pit of no, all. it's a moneyless pit. Yes, it's a moneyless pit. Well, I don't know if you count all the money people have put into. If you don't, if you're not familiar with Oak Island, there's a, a legend that there's supposed to be like this incredibly valuable buried treasure there, and for like 150 years, people have been going there and digging. I think they're almost to the center of the earth now. I think so. They've got to be close, unless it's filled itself in again, which it does very frequently. Yes, so, I'm surprised it's even an island anymore. I'm surprised it's not a, an island shaped hole how many people have gone there to dig. So really where it comes into the vernacular of North America, which is where we are, is through the Money Pit movie. Tom Hanks? Yeah, 1984 Tom Hanks movie, which is a remake of a movie I know you love, Mr. Blanding's Oh, Mr. Blanding Builds His Dream House. Yes. It's a Cary Grant movie. Yes. I love that movie. Which is a far superior movie to Money Pit. They're both very good. Yes. They're different. They're really different. I mean, they both build a house... They're repairing a house. Mr. Blanding's is building a house. Yes. I mean, it's far more expensive than he thinks it's going to be. It's always, you know, another thing. But I don't know. I don't know if you can call that a remake. They're very different. So. Oh, um, Cary Grant. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so that that's where Money Pit comes from. Mm, interesting. Well, 
Gideon's an illusionist. It's not real magic. Yes. Nelson. Maplin is like the most out of touch. I think he's the only body in the village who believes in magic. It creates the pretense of sorcery. It's cowardly. Cowardly. Murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters. Hellfire. The house of sin and darkness. <laughs> Turn on a light. He is so obsessed. I really do like that scene early on, though, when he and Sone kind of face off. And Sone says, I don't want to believe in the God that you believe in. Yeah. A, a God who's vengeful and mean. And that's that's not my God. Yeah. Sone drinks too much and his wife is a looney tune. But he seems like a good vicar, like somebody you could talk to. When they go visit the florist, there's a low-level policeman that says, Sir? And it's a mom, mom, I got a party right there. <laughs> he gets to say, sir. Then there's more God arguing. Yeah. <laughs> I have proof. And then suddenly, there's a pile of money in Luke's house. Yeah. that That's a mom, mom, I got a part too. Sir? Yeah. Here's an envelope of cash. Yes. That's when Luke says, Hannah said the, that we weren't making any money. That's yes. what she said. What he didn't know is she's blackmailing half the village. Yes. No wonder she's dead. Hannah was not a good person. Andrew Maplin did four parishes in five years. Yeah. And that's not because he's like, I come in and clean out the riffraff and then they move me on. No, I'm murderers and fornicators and lake of fire. And Sorcerers and idolaters. And secret recordings and getting my video camera dunged in dirt. Yeah, that. so that's a, a video camera that is concurrent with the time and mm -hmm. everything. But it would take much clearer pictures than that. Uh, in the even, dark? Even at night. With fire? Yeah. That contrast wouldn't it, make it go kind of Looney Tune? No, I think so. Did you happen to look at the photos that they put on the board at the cop shop of the suspects? No. Well, I did, but I didn't see anything. So There's that. a couple of interesting things. Okay. So Gideon and Annabelle's photos are clearly from their wedding. She's got on the white veil okay and he's clearly in a tux and they look really nice and luke and hannah well so they both have flower garlands on their heads okay but from what you can see of his outfit he's wearing suspenders either morris dancing suspenders or later hosen well they are part of the cult so so did they have a pagan wedding where they wore flower garlands on their heads I are guess. they from their wedding i guess i don't know the other weird thing about them that I've never seen before in Midsummer is they have QR code stickers stuck on oh, them. Mm. All the photos do. However, Did it's the identical QR code on every one of them. Oh. So it must be... Like, like an empty QR code. No, no, because there's a number next to it too that's the same. So okay. I think it's like the case number. Oh, okay. So it's to say this is a document from that case. Okay. Not this is a link to more information about Ailsa. QR codes are those weird boxes. Black and white barcode thing. barcode things. I took a screenshot of it. Yeah. I tried to scan it. I couldn't. I don't... Either it's not a real QR code or it just wasn't sharp enough for it to work. But okay. I don't think it was real. Okay. But they are the That's same. That's weird that they have them on there. Though. I think it's kind of cool. It's very modern. Yes, they probably do that now. It makes yes. it would make sense that they would. The curate gets a phone call to go meet somebody out in the forest at the... The temple. The temple. Which is just... Why would you do that? It's Carol calling. Yes. What could she have said to him that would have got him out there? I do not know. Where are you? I'm here. About to die. Yeah. <laughs> have you not watched Midsummer before? <laughs> At least he didn't turn around and go, oh, it's you. Somebody has a mask on. Of course she, they do. She throws that knife. She does. And not only does she hit him with the blade end and not the handle... She actually hits him. She hits him with the right end, and she throws it hard enough to go through his ribcage into his heart. Yep. She is a better magician. She's a better magician. <laughs> I couldn't do that. Could you do that? No, and you're a better magician than me. <laughs> I couldn't do it from five feet. I might be able to conk him on the head with the handle, <laughs> you know? And then she just stabs him again for fun. Stab and stab and wraps him up like a mummy. Related to the mummy television show? No, maybe? like the... Um, like the earlier... The ceremony. straw man. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Kate says it's swaddling. Swaddling. She says the swaddling is going to get in the way of time of death measurements. Yeah. Because she needs to stick a thermometer somewhere where the sun doesn't shine. Yeah. She can't get to it because <laughs> of the swaddling. 
I, I don't think I would have called it swaddling. I think they do it mostly <laughs> That's what you in do the liver a... these days. Well. Liver temp. Yeah, well, they would have to cut a hole in his side and put it in there. I guess. But swaddling is, like, cute. Thank goodness that we have the Insider's Guide to Magic here. <laughs> Nelson's got the definitive guide. <laughs> not a real book. Not a it's re- not a real book? No. Oh, but it's based on so many books that are real. Yes. Can I tell you about some? Okay, yes. Because I went looking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And really what, initially what I was looking for was I I knew that magicians named their tricks. Mm -hmm. Like Houdini had, oh, what did he call his underwater escape? It was like. The chamber of death or something. Poseidon's tomb or something, you know. Um, And so even though two magicians might do very similar illusions, they would have different names so they could, you know, brand them. Yes. And so I went looking for names of those tricks and I wound up looking in, in Google Books and but I didn't I didn't want recent ones. I wanted older ones. Yeah. Right. So what I found are two guides to magic, one from 1785 and one from 1857 okay. that are they are pure magic. Okay. Right. So you expect these magicians to name their tricks cool things. Yes. But no. In 1785, now remember, 1785 is like 10 years after America was founded. Yep. This guy, Philip Astley, writes this book, Natural Magic Revealed. Okay. And nearly every page has a new trick. Okay. That's cool. The table of contents is fascinating. Okay. Because these are not fun names. Are you ready? Okay. The card springing out of the pack and flying into the air without being touched trick. What, What happens in that trick? I don't know. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. A loaded pistol with powder and ball and discharged at a person who dexterously receives the ball in the point of a knife or sword trick. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Now, by 1857, we get the magician's art of conjuring. Oh, okay. This is a little more spooky. Yes. So I skimmed through that table of contents and I've picked out a couple of gems for you. Are you ready? Okay. Hit me. The omelet cooked in a hat. (laughs) I don't want to eat an omelet cooked in a hat. The old man in a chair. I do that magic trick (laughs) all the time. To conjure nuts in your ear. How else? No. (laughs) (laughs) To make paper apparently incombustible. Okay. Six methods to guess a number thought of. So I guess if one doesn't work, you try the next one. Guess. <laughs> what number are you thinking of? Six. No, five. No, <laughs> two. Am I warm? Am I warm? Three jealous husbands. Ooh. But these are my two favorites. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. The electrical cat. <laughs> this trick does indeed involve an actual cat. Oof. It does not die. Okay. That's good. If you do it right. <laughs> But my favorite okay. is the unneighborly balls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry a... for my unneighborly balls. <laughs> there is a trick called the unneighborly balls. It involves magnets. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's... It's on a different page than to conjure nuts in your ear. <laughs> you don't want to mix those two tricks up. You don't want unneighborly balls in your ear. That no. would be bad. No. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they're just they're just fantastic, these books, just yep. to skim through. You know, yep. they're out there in the public domain. And some of them have schematics to help you understand. And they are just out there (laughs) like it's clear from the the illustration above how this trek should be executed and the illustration gives you no idea where those unneighborly balls are like you just don't you just can't tell no oh it was so much fun to look at wow did you see gideon had a tattoo on his arm he has a lot and most of them are like japanese or chinese i couldn't see the one on his inner left arm i tried to figure Mm -mm. it out but and the actor who plays Gideon, whose name is Andrew Lee Potts. Yeah. The longest running thing he's been in is Primeval, probably. Yeah. It's near as I can tell. He has some tattoos, but not those. Oh, okay. So they're fake. For the episode, Sir Hugo Melmoth died a long time ago. 
So it makes sense for Lorna to be there because she is a descendant of his. Yeah. It doesn't make sense that Carol pushes him back to town. I, I don't know why she, I don't know. I don't understand her motive at all. Okay. We'll have to talk about it at the end after the murders because she just crazy mom. I That's all I can give her. How hard is it to get an SD card out of a camera? Well, I don't know how beat up it was. I guess. If it's super beat up. Maybe. Can we borrow your computer? <laughs> it's not magic. I know that. I just, uh, computer inside the autopsy room. I'm not really sure I could wipe it down enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice suite she has. She does. She has a Big Mac. Yeah. Speaking of computers, when they're there um, in um, Maplin's office and they find the video camera, uh, Nelson's looking at his computer. Did you notice what's sitting right next to Maplin's laptop? Uh, Fire and Brimstone are us. No, um, no. No, what? My first Bible. My first... Okay, he should not be around children in any way. It's... Got little kids on the front. It looks like not a Dr. Seuss Bible, but, you know, close. It's kind of creepy that he has it. Yeah, it is. Can you imagine him teaching Sunday school to little kids? Oh, no. If you don't want to burn in the flames. (laughs) Like, Reverend Maplin is scary, Mom. (laughs) So she is the the priestess of Sulis. The Celtic sun goddess? Yes. No, no, she's not. No. She's the Celtic goddess of thermal vents <laughs> of bath of fart smelling water that's what she is <laughs> when you say bath you mean the city of bath i mean where the they have thermal the, spring where they have bath. the thermal springs yes. that smell like sulfur yes. so it's romano british worshipers and she relates of course to minerva which is why she has the headdress mm-hmm. and everything like that they found out a whole bunch of votive objects of hers that were lead tablets oh cool yeah, cool but as with the uh i mean don't lick them yeah but <laughs> there was a lot of lead back then and it's all really toxic to archaeologists who find it now. greeks and romans used to chew lead oh, like gum they, uh, they didn't know how did they ever survive elizabethans used to rub arsenic on their faces it's, it's a miracle we got here they didn't know yeah. Now, this trick that Gideon does at the dinner theater thing. Yes. The high ticket event. Yes, with the posh nibbles. I think is super cool. I okay. knew exactly how it was done immediately, but I thought it was really well done. So With the spotlights swinging from the chair to the mirror to the chair to the mirror. Yeah. I thought that was cool. And so he walks in through the mirror. Yeah. That, which is really because because so, there's a duplicate room on the other side of the wall. Yeah, and he does some he does some hand magic there mm-hmm. with cards and and uh, guess he the number reads and the thing, vicar's reads mind the and vicar's creeps mind, everybody does out. Does some total cold reading and stuff Maplin like that. is the thing that you were afraid of that's gone now. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? Yeah. I'm sorry. Whoopsie. <laughs> and he does the gun trick. Yes, this is an infamous trick. That yes. lots and lots of illusionists have done. Yes. So do you know how it's supposed to be done? Like how it actually works? So when it goes right. So they do this trick in The Prestige mm-hmm. also, which is a very good movie. You should watch if you haven't seen it. So the idea is that based on a book that's really, really, really good. Yes. That you shoot the gun, but it's actually nothing comes out of the gun. And that the the ball, the 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 ammunition is given to the magician who then spits it out based on, you know, having it in their mouth already. Like mm. nothing actually travels through the air. Actually, it does. Okay. That's why the pane of glass is there. Okay. Is to demonstrate that something actually comes out of the gun. Okay. So the way it's supposed to work is you hand the dupe, the audience member, a bullet. They mark mm. it, right? Yeah. And then oh, you... Are we going to get kicked out of the magic circle? I already did. Okay, I'm not okay, in it okay, anymore. Okay. I wrote my thesis. They didn't like okay. it. Then you was pre- it on fart magic? <laughs> yes, it was on... Ball magic. It was on unneighborly balls. They didn't like it. <laughs> so you, you go to load the bullet in the gun and you swap it, right? Yeah. And the, the, the gun that... The bullet you actually put in is mostly made of wax. Okay. And it has very little propellant. Okay. Okay. 
So now the magician has the bullet, which they can slip into their mouth when nobody's looking. And the audience member has the gun loaded with a bullet that can't really hurt you. Yeah, okay? it's like a fake bullet. Right. So it has enough gunpowder to come out of the gun and break through the glass to prove that they actually shot something. But that mostly takes the speed out of it. The velocity is kind of nothing after it goes through the glass. Yeah. And the heat of the explosion melts a lot of it anyway. Yeah. Right. So there's there's nothing left of the bullet that came out of the gun for anybody to find. Yes. Unless you look at the glass very, very closely. Yeah. And which you might see a little bit nobody, of wax, right? Nobody does. That's how it's supposed to work. Yes. But a lot of people do it poorly. So this And it's is, not a trick that you want to mess around with. This is a, a trick that has all sorts of lore around it. Because that's part of the that's part of the kayfabe, right? That you say, Oh, six people have died doing this trick. But isn't a lot of that actual real stuff at the background? A lot of people have died doing this trick. Okay. <laughs> about 13, at least, wow. have died doing this trick. Let me tell you about the three most notable ones. Okay. These are awesome. Okay. It's sad that somebody died. Yes. But they were doing the trick, so... Yeah. In 1869, an illusionist named Adam Epstein uh, did this trick, and uh, but with um, a shotgun. Oh, uh, single barreled shotgun. Yeah. He picked the wrong asshole in the audience. Yeah. Because it was a blank that they loaded, but this guy put nails in the barrel too. Oh. So when the blank went off, the shell didn't come out, but the nails did. Oh. And killed the illusionist, killed wow. Adam Epstein, which I think is murder. I'm sorry. Yeah. You When you put a gun in, in someone's hand in the audience... That person better be a plant. Yeah. I would think you would want it to be a plant or you want to control that person so much. Like your assistant had better like have their hands all the time. Yeah. Like, cause this guy put nails. Oh, that's murder. There. The second one though is so interesting. So you, you mentioned the prestige. Yes. Do you know who Chung Ling Su is? So the prestige, there is a old Asian magician mm -hmm. who's supposedly cripple mm -hmm. that the characters aren't sure if is actually old or not mm -hmm. and that that he does these amazing tricks and they can't figure it out yeah well and the conceit is that he's not actually asian and he's not actually crippled yeah he is that committed committed to ma magic so he he acts crippled 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 yep. a year He's that committed. So that character is based on Chung Ling Su, uh -huh. whose name was actually William Ellsworth Campbell Robinson. Oh, wow. All right. And he didn't go that far. Yeah. But he did, he, he did the bullet trick. Okay. And it's really important when you do the bullet trick that you clean the gun super, super well in between because you can't have any residual gunpowder because it's very precise how much powder you need to make that wax bullet go. Yes. But not go too fast. Yes. Where it would hurt you. And the practice at that time was to use a double barreled gun with the wax one in, in one and a real shell in the other. Okay. And so they would put the real shell in, they would put the wax one in, and the audience member would think they were shooting the real one, but they're shooting the wax one. Yeah. But in his case, there was so much gunpowder left in the gun that it accidentally shot the real shell off Ooh. and shot him right in the chest, right on stage. Wow. And after he was shot, he yelled, oh my God, something's happened, lower the curtains, in his Brooklyn accent. Oh, that's a... That's, uh... An eye opener if you're in the audience. He sort of broke character, he broke which character. is completely understandable, I suppose. And and but he died. So it's Herman all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. And the the last one I'll tell you about is in 1922. This guy named H. T. Sartle, who whose stage name was the Black Wizard of the West. Nice, because he was in the Old West. Yep, doing illusion. And he bought the wax bullets. They didn't practice. He was like, eh, wax bullets will be fine. You just shoot me on stage. It'll never, you know, yeah. nothing will go wrong. And he gave the gun to his wife, who was his assistant, with the wax bullets. And she was supposed to shoot him. 
But what he didn't realize was that uh, she hated his guts and, and really wanted to get away from him. And so she just shot him and then said, the trick didn't work. We never rehearsed it. I don't know what he wanted me to do. I followed his instructions. Oh, did she get away with it? Yeah. Oh, nice. She murdered him on stage in front of a crowd. Got away with it. Got away with it. Wow. Because she said, well, we should have rehearsed it. I, I, I just I just followed his instructions. I don't know what what went wrong. That's, that only should be he, in a book. Only he knew how it was supposed to work. That he wouldn't should, tell me. That should be in a book or a story. Yep. yep. Just shot him in front of the audience. <laughs> Man, you want to talk about unneighborly balls? That takes some. Meanwhile, in the background, Annabelle dies. <laughs> <laughs> so she is in the duplicate room. Yes. For the mirror trick. Yes. Dead. Yeah. Before Gideon walks out. Yeah. It has to be because his mom killed her and she's in the audience on the real room, in the real room. Well, it's right? the amazing teleporting mom. At so that she point. could not be outside with a pistol, with yeah. a silencer, shooting Annabelle. Yeah. She's there. Yes. Now, I guess we don't see her the whole time. Maybe she could have slipped out. But my impression is that she's shot dead before the lights go down. So why Gideon doesn't see her, I don't know. But he seems genuinely upset. Like, yeah. I do think he's upset. I think he loves her. Yeah. I think he's sad that she's having an affair. But maybe he hoped that... He could get her back. I think that he thought moving to the country would give them enough space away from his mother, maybe in the room, mm -hmm. for them to build, gain back their re relationship. Yeah. If it weren't for, you know, his assistant and his mom. I, I, I That's the only way I can make sense of it is that she's already dead and he just doesn't see her. But I don't know how he couldn't. Because when the lights go up, everybody can see her. He yeah. would have had to step over her almost to yeah. walk through. But it is kind of a cool trick. Because we, it hasn't been revealed that it's a duplicate room. So it's like she's dead in the mirror, but she's not dead in the room. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of a it's cool kind, moment. It's kind of a cool I moment. I thought that was cool. And then he goes and prays to his dad's poster. What's he doing there? I don't know. I think he's just talking to himself. And okay, if my father is a magician and I have a poster of his in my ginormous house, because I'm a ginormous magician... It's going to be bigger than eight and a half by 11. Well, but remember, his mom has been verbally blasting his dad his whole life. I would That have he thought... was a loser. He wasn't very good at it. The who... fact that he even has his poster is probably I want to know why deal. it was called Summer Magic and who Alan Jones is because he directed it. <laughs> so then we get to hear that Sir Hugo jumped into the fire yes. when he died. He sacrificed himself to return as the phoenix and lorna is crazy enough to think that really happened no i think she knows that didn't happen but she wants to imitate that effect so she doesn't think that sir hugo could have survived it but maybe his spirit did yeah or something like and that. and so she wants hugo and he she wants um gideon to do, to do, a do trick. the trick yeah and she doesn't really want him to die. No, and I don't, th you know, I think she's a genuine hearted pagan in that I don't think she believes in magic, mm -hmm. but she believes in the ritual and But the she nature. also doesn't know the truth about yeah, Sir Hugo and no. what a bad person he was. No. And so no. she's letting that kind of taint what she's doing. Yes. In but the meantime, completely unimportantly, we find out that Luke's name is actually Seth. And he went to prison for four years because they accidentally killed a homeless man by burning down a, a barn. Why he would have come back to Midsummer at all, I, I do not understand. People I would don't. recognize him yeah. right away. Gideon Instant. did. Yeah. And none of it's important. No. It's not important. Except that, you know, it's somebody who knows something about Gideon that might be bad that they might use against him. So now Luke's got to go. The other thing that's important and interesting at this point is the amount of wood by the Barnaby's door. Now it's June. Yeah. And they have like a quarter cord of wood there. Yeah. What what is it doing there? There's no wood hob. They have a fireplace? I have not they seen must. they must have a fireplace. We need to talk wicker for a second. Okay. Gideon gets in a big basket on the pyre. Yes. Right. Wearing his mummy outfit. Yeah. His burlap suit. Yes. We have seen that basket earlier in the episode. 
Do you know where we saw it? No. We saw it because Theo is making it. Oh, okay. When he's out in the barn and then makes out with Annabelle. He's Gideon making see, that basket? He's weaving that basket. I didn't know he was a weaver. I didn't either. Have you ever made a basket? They would take forever. Okay. It's really hard to do. You have to soak those reeds in water so they get malleable. Then you have to work fast with them when you get them out. Plus, it's a magic basket, and he's too busy playing kissy face. It's a double layered. It's yeah. got t- it's got a top layer where Gideon is, and a bottom layer where they've already stashed Luke. Yeah, and then it's got a secret escape hatch in the back. Yeah, and he wove it. Yeah, Theo supposedly. How does she overpower Theo and put him in the basket? No, Luke. L- sorry, Luke. I don't know. I guess she hits him on the head or I guess. dopes him up or something. Maybe. But wouldn't Theo, if he went all to all that effort to weave the basket for the stunt, wouldn't he notice if she went out in the middle of the night and added another floor to it, basically? You would think. You would think. So not only does she know, Carol knows about nitroglycerin and yes. remote-controlled explosives. Knife She's throwing. a master knife thrower. And Weaver Supreme. And teleporting silencer shooter. Yes. <laughs> But yes, she can put a second floor in a basket strong enough that her son can lay on top of it and well, not fall through. Sarah, she is a better magician. <laughs> she uses flash powder. <laughs> when they're about to arrest her. At the pagan party. <clears throat> Barnaby says, arrest her, cuff her. Yep. And instead, Nelson just walks away. Well, I think I think he knows what's go- about to happen. Apparently, he does. How he knows, I don't know. Well, maybe he looked at her notes. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he could smell flash powder on her. Ah, uh, maybe. Flash powder would be a very dangerous thing to have on you. Okay. In a big flammable robe next to a giant bonfire. Okay. I watched too many videos on flash powder today. Okay. <laughs> So first of all, every single video about flash powder tells you not to make flash powder, right? Right. Like it is. This is super duper dangerous. It's super duper dangerous. Second of all, it has a tendency in storage to go off. Right. It's (laughs) so incendiary. If you, if you jostle it, it can explode. Well, it's fuel and a metallic substance. Right. And so it goes off quite often. Yeah. If you jostle it, like some but of them. But she's keeping it in her sleeve. Yeah. Apparently, just in case. Just. She's got a secret pocket in her well, pagan robe. She is. A better magician. A better than magician. <laughs> apparently so. I can't believe Lorna drugs her husband. I find that utterly unacceptable. I drug my husband so I can go pagan. If I found out you were drugging me so you could sneak out of the house and go help orphan children, I would still be mad at you. I would hope so. I don't care what you're going to do. Yeah. You don't get to do that. No. There's got to be a law. There should be a Against law. that. Yes. Magnus is like, I wish you wouldn't do that to me. <laughs> like, you think? But then she's instantly like, oh, Magnus, take me home. I'm sorry. My quilted sorry. jacket's all wrong. I really should go now. I'll go puck her face somewhere else. I'm we a need bad, to go somewhere a for a fresh, fresh start. <laughs> We're just going to let St. Cyprian's fall apart. I'm glad Magnus takes her back because no one else is. And Midsummer Oaks doesn't have a church anymore because, you know, Mabel gives up holding up the place yep. and it just lets it go. And where's that 200 grand go? I don't know. They take off with it. I don't know soon. <laughs> the curate stole it. We don't know where it went. He's dead now, so we can't ask him. Yeah. Meanwhile, Magnus is like, Daddy needs a new bottle of rum. <laughs> Then we have a nice dinner at the Barnabys with Charlie, Kate, and the Barnabys. Mm-hmm. And Sykes, yes. who steals the sausages. Yes. Which are strung together in a way that's not realistic. Yeah, those are not real sausages. No. So Charlie does a trick here. Mm-hmm. So how do you think they did that at the end? Well, I think they probably did it with, you know, they cut. Yes. Right. So... I watched the filming very carefully, <laughs> frame by frame. Yeah, of course. And I think they stopped it. Somebody ran up, took the bottle out, and they continued on. Yeah. Right? It's pretty easy. And then they to edited do. it together really, really pretty well. Pretty easy to do. But, How would you do that trick in reality? Do you know? Well, a couple of ways you can do it in reality, right? You can squash the bag so that it. Usually you do it with a much smaller bottle. Mm-hmm. So you can squash the bag so that it looks 
like the bottle's been squished, but it's actually just flat. Even if you just, yeah, because you put the bottle in standing up. If you yeah. just let it fall over while you yeah. squash it, it would convince most people. Another way to do it is if you rip the bag at the back and it falls onto your arm while you do the squishing and then you throw it all away together. Ah, uh, so. you, you let it go down your sleeve. Yes. Now, I did watch that only the bag goes into the bushes behind him. Mm -hmm. But there's no bottle with it. And he clearly has no bottle in his hand. Right. So they clearly did a little bit of magic. He's a better magician. <laughs> a little screen magic. Because he's there. got screen magic. Yeah. They mentioned smoke and mirrors for the first time yes. in that scene okay. at the Barnabys. Do you, do you want to guess where smoke and mirrors comes from? Well, it seems... I mean, it's a reference to illusionists, Magic right? Illusion. They use a lot of smoke. They use a lot of mirrors. And because it's in English, I'm going to go Shakespeare. No. there's so many Shakespearean origins. Nope. Okay. Take another guess. I'm going to give okay. you two guesses because you are never going to guess so where it comes from. Number two, I'm going to go Bible. Okay. No. So no Shakespeare, no Bible. In your lifetime, it was coined. Wow. The origin of smoke and mirrors was first used. So that phrase, yep. and I'm talking the OED says it yep. was first used by Jimmy Breslin in his book, Notes from Impeachment Summer, 1975, about the Watergate scandal. Wow. That's where smoke and mirrors was coined. That's where smoke and mirrors is coined? Yep. So it's- Watergate. It is an, it is a metaphor in a book about Watergate. Yep. That has become part of the vernacular. Yep. Now, he's referencing, like, the way illusionists distract you. Look over here while I'm doing something over there yeah. as a metaphor for the Watergate break-in and the scandal around it. But that is where the phrase comes from. Well, you have to make sure that you don't have your unneighborly balls covered in smoke <laughs> and mirrors. It'll give it away. Yeah. You know? The electrical cat comes through and lights the whole place on fire, and it's just a mess. Yes. And that is... Murder by magic. Murder by magic. She must use magic because, wow, I don't know how she does some of them. She's super skilled at all kinds of things. Yeah. She's definitely going to escape from prison. I'm yeah. sorry. They're never going to hold her. She's never going to get in. <laughs> she's never going to get in the car. She's, she's going to do the thing with the with the handcuffs and be gone. Oh, yeah. And then, and then like, boom, it, you know, that, that exploding powder and she's just disappeared yep. and her robe just falls to the ground empty and she's gone. She's gone. Carol's gone. Where did she go? Where? All right. Best corpse. <laughs> nice corpse. Hannah, Maplin or Annabelle? Okay. Annabelle, we see very briefly. Mm -hmm. Maplin, we're not even sure it's him. It's him. Yeah. But when I, he's swaddled, it's him. I got to say Hannah with her head halfway yeah. in the piano. Yeah, I got to say it's it it's it's spring. Hannah with her head in the piano, yeah. uh, which just sounds like something from a Edward Gorey book. Yes. <laughs> H is for Hannah with her head in a piano. It should be in a, a piano. It should be Hannah with her head in a harpsichord or a piano. A piano after the credits? Okay. <laughs> Luke has got to run the pub all by himself. Gideon. He's grateful to have I been saved. moves back to the city. Maybe. Maybe. I don't think he's happy. He's definitely firing Theo. Yes. Theo needs to go, go. Yes. Theo needs to go. Magnus and Lorna go to another parish and spend the $200,000. <laughs> what about the Proberts? Ailsa and Roderick? I, I don't know why they were even there. No. And Dorothea should have her own show. Yeah. Dr. Grenville goes on to, to have an awesome show about an eccentric uh, historian. Yes. Who knows cool stuff. I have two horrible movies for you. Oh, Return of Horrible Movies. Oh, okay. yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. This movie is terrible. Ha, I bet Mark's seen it. The first one is a 2002 movie. Okay. That includes uh, Joe Absalom, who plays Luke in this episode. Okay. And Lord of the Rings? No. No. Sorry. I always get him confused with the guy from Lord of the Rings, but it's not him. Here is the synopsis. While filming an advertisement, some extreme sports enthusiasts unwittingly stop a group of terrorists. Okay. Is that it? That's it. Oh. Ooh. Uh. Do you want an actor? Yeah. It stars Rufus Sewell. 
What? Who I love. I love Rufus uh, Sewell. We love Rufus Sewell. Yeah, he's who is an actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he stars in this. What movie. the hell is he doing in this movie? It's got four point four out of ten. Ooh. The Fast and the Fury. No, this movie includes. This is so two thousand two. It's uh, extreme. It's you extreme. Know. Is it got dor- Doritos? And- it's got skiing. Yeah. Snowboarding, skydiving, whitewater rafting, helicopters, motorcycles, and base jumping in it. Yeah, Rufus Sewell doesn't do it. And all and mount, more Mountain Dew than you can throw a stick oh, at. I can imagine. It's called Extreme Ops. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most 2002 y thing it of is. all time. It's called Extreme Ops. Wow. And no, I couldn't verify that Limp Biscuit is on the soundtrack. But it should be. But we know it <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So that's one for me. Okay. You had no clue. No clue. All what right. is Rufus Sewell? Uh, fire your he, agent. He's dude. like the lead extreme sportsman, too. Oh, he needed to There's fire There's a picture of him skiing. Agent. Oh, he needed to fire his agent bad. Yeah. Are you ready for the next one? Okay. This is even more recent. It's so, from, you, so you got one. Yeah, I got one. 2016. Okay. This movie has 3.9 out of 10 stars. It... Uh, stars Andrew Lee Potts, who plays Gideon in okay. this episode. Are you ready for the summary, the yes. synopsis? After the death of his father, Tim returns to his childhood village in Somerset to find something sinister as disturbing the idyllic peace of the villagers. As people disappear and gruesome body parts mount, the horrific truth emerges that something, I can't tell you, is haunting the moors. As suspicion escalates, Tim is on the hook to make amends for his tragic teenage mistakes years before. I can't tell you that word about what's haunting the Moors because it would give it too much okay. away. It's 2016. Mm-hmm. Tagline, Mother Nature Bites Back. What? Mm-hmm. Never heard of this. On movie. the Moors. Never heard. Is, is it a hound? No. I have no idea. This movie is called The Hatching. That is it a bird? It's a crocodile. It's a, what on the moors? What? It's a giant <laughs> crocodile. What? That movie doesn't exist. Does too. Oh my god! One of my favorite reviews said the croc looks like it was made from leftover Wellington boots. <laughs> <laughs> the hatching. The hatching. The crocodile. It's a crocodile on the moor. It's massive. It is so massive. Now, granted, there's some little ponds. There's some rowboats in this movie and okay. some canals. Okay. And that alligator, that crocodile. But is why a, is it? Is a big one. <laughs> why is it there? How did it get there? I don't there? know. They don't live places that oh. are cold and everybody's got puffer coats on, but there's a big crocodile eating everybody. <laughs> it's Lake Placid in the moor. Yes. <laughs> I can only assume that somebody released it there. I have to think that it's probably the it. best giant alligator in the Moors movie of ever. <laughs> it's the best Somerset crocodile movie ever made. <laughs> wow. Two out of two for me. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. Because you haven't seen Extreme Ops with nope. Rufus Sewell or nope. The Hatching. That. Mother Nature Bites back you can find midsummer maniacs on twitter instagram and email we also post the face group facebook groups for midsummer and acorn and we take care of the subreddit for midsummer murders and we're also everywhere you can find maniacs we're everywhere yes everywhere remember if you're listening on youtube like this like and subscribe and hit the bell Mm-hmm. what do we got coming up next lots oh, of stuff <laughs> We are halfway done the month of October, Mm -hmm. which means our next mini episode, which is mini episode 16, will be released on October 22nd, which is next Friday. And what's that episode called? That is uh, For Death Prepare. Nice. So it has Kevin Watley in it as the 50th New Barnaby episode. And Kevin Watley played Lewis. Yes. And then next week is episode 103, The Ballad of Midsummer County for us. Mm Mm-hmm. Season 17, episode three, where I promise not to talk too much about these people have never played guitars in their entire <laughs> lives. You heard him. He promised. I promise. We'll, we'll hold him to it. 
Uh, and then our last mini episode is uh, mini episode 16, The Witches of Angels Rise, which is on October 29th. Ooh, Ooh, spooky, spooky right before Halloween. Now, please remember that these new episodes have not been broadcast in England. Only right. one of them. Uh, season 22, episode three has been broadcast. And so we will do spoiler free mini episodes yep. so we don't ruin it for anybody. Yep. They're spoiler but free. If you go to- online to chitty chat about it, remember yep. that some people haven't been able to see it yet. And then we finish off the month on the 1st of November with a vintage murder. Awesome. Wow. We got a lot to do before the end of October, don't we? Yes, we do. That's all right. Those it's are crazy, all going to be fun. Crazy, crazy, crazy. All right. Until then, bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Has what does he call it? A beneficiary? A be, he's benefic beneficized? What's that word? I don't. Know. Beneficed. <laughs>